Welcome to our growth track. We are back again for another exciting and very important study. Um, today, we, today we're talking about relationships. More importantly, I will say it this way, resolving conflict God's way. Our key scripture is Matthew 7, verse 1 through 8. All right, so here we go. Um, I want to say it this way. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, there will eventually be conflict. And that is the truth. Well, you might say, I don't want any. I don't want any conflict. Well, listen, it's an inevitable part of relationships and being a part of something. And because we're all members of his body and connected by relationships, there will be conflict. It has to happen. So no matter how much we all love God and want to serve him and advance his kingdom, it's going to come. Conflict will always come. Conflict can take many forms and have many results. Gossip, slander can slowly poison an entire congregation. Unresolved tensions between the pastor and other leaders can destroy cooperation and rob a church of effective leadership. Prolonged conflict within family can lead to rebellious children or even worse, bitter divorce. Deadlocks on church committees can cripple needed ministries. Disputes between members who do business with one another can lead to disputes and lawsuits. Anytime a conflict between two people in a church is improperly resolved, it can grow and infect an entire congregation. We're talking about resolving conflicts God's way. When this happens, it's in direct opposition to what Jesus prayed for the church. He says this, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me. Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that they, or that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. That's John chapter 17, verse 20 through 23. I, I, was, I was quoting the NLT translation. Well, apparently, conflict was a part of the early church. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have said, let us pursue things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify one another. That's Romans 14, 19. Paul knew conflicts would come, but he also recognized that conflicts could be resolved if those involved would pursue the things that make for peace. So conflicts will come, but they do not, but uh, they don't have to end in broken relationships and mistrust if we endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That scripture is Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 3. So we have to see conflict as an opportunity. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad or destructive. It can ultimately work for our good, according to Romans 8.28. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 through chapter 11, verse 1, shows three opportunities that can come out of conflict. We can glorify God by trusting, obeying, and imitating him. We can serve others by helping bear their burdens or confronting them in love. We can be propelled into spiritual growth by confessing faults and turning from attitudes that promote conflict. Yet, these aren't what we think of during conflict because most of us are bent on either escaping the, the situation or overcoming the person with whom we are in conflict with. But opposition can promote the will of God in our lives. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a conflict between Elkanah's two wives. Paniah had children, 
but Hannah didn't because the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, it says, provoked or aggravated, annoyed, irritated her sore to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6. So it was the conflict that drove Hannah to pray or to prayer and promise from which came Samuel, who became one of the greatest prophets there ever was. But it all came out of a conflict that worked in Hannah's favor. Though we, though we don't like conflict, the best way to deal with it is to continually ask ourselves, how can I please and honor the Lord in this situation? Don't let it drive you away from God and your brother, but see it as an opportunity to glorify God, serve others, and grow spiritually. There are three ways to resolve conflict. Ready for this? Three ways. Number one, get the log out of your own eye. Can we all say that together? Get the log out of my own eye. The Bible says this, why worry about a speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you say, let me help you get rid of, of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Christ said that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 and 4. So there are two kinds of logs you need to look for in your life when dealing with a conflict. Do we have a critical, negative, or overly sensitive attitude that has led to unnecessary conflict? Our attitudes can contribute and even be the cause of conflict. So there was a woman who couldn't go to a football game because every time they got in a huddle, she thought they were talking about her. Have we actually contributed to the conflict by the things we have said or done? Words and actions are powerful, and we're responsible for what we do. We will reap the harvest of what we have sown even in our relationships. If more than one person has a problem with you, you need to take a good introspect look at yourself. When you have identified ways you've wronged others, you need to admit it, number one, and, honest, and be honest and thorough about your findings. So seven A's of confession. Address everyone involved. Avoid the words if, but, and maybe. Admit specific actions and attitudes. Apologize and express sorrow for the way you have affected them. Ask for forgiveness. Accept the consequences. Alter your behavior by committing to change how you deal with people. However, the most important thing you can do in getting the log out of your life and changing the way you deal with people is to go beyond the confession of wrong behavior and identify the root cause of that behavior. The Bible teaches that conflict comes from desires we battle in our own hearts. What is, the causing, or what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong, but you want only what will give you pleasure. That's James chapter 4, verse 1 and 3. Some of the root causes of conflict are this, a desire to, to conceal the truth, bend others to our own will, make others feel less so we can feel better, get revenge for the wrongs we have suffered. So here's number two. Go and show your brother his fault. We think this is something we can't or shouldn't do. This isn't wrong or unscriptural. It's part of maintaining and strengthening our relationships with one another. Jesus didn't say you shouldn't deal with the moat in your brother's eye. He didn't say that. He said, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll be able to see well enough to deal with the speck in your brother's eye. Again, that's Matthew 7, 5. Now, before you rush off to confrontation, remember it's important to overlook minor offenses because we all have, have them. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression, Proverbs 19, 11. 
People with good sense restrain their anger. They earn esteem by overlooking wrongs. That's the NLT version. When, when should an offense be overlooked? When you can answer no to the following. Are they seriously dishonoring God? Has it permanently damaged my, my relationship with them? Is it seriously hurting other people? Is it seriously hurting the offender himself? If the answer is yes, the offense is too serious to overlook, and it's, and, and it's imperative that you take your complaint to the person. If thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If, his, if he hears you, you have gained your brother. Matthew 18, 15. As you do this, pray for humility and wisdom. Plan your words carefully. Think of how you would want to be con um, confronted. Anticipate likely reaction and plan ap appropriate responses. Choose the right time and place. Assume the best about the person until you have facts to prove otherwise. Listen carefully. He that answer answers a matter before he hear is a fool and shame and shameful. Proverbs 18, 13. Speak the truth in love with the intention of restoring them. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that, that, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 4, 29. Wait for a response. Recognize your limits. Only God can change people. If the initial confrontation doesn't work, you may look for a different approach and try again. If repeated attempts aren't successful and the matter is still too serious to overlook, you may have to involve one or two others. If that doesn't work, then it's to be taken to the church, not to the congregation, but the pastor. Matthew 18, 16, and 17. And number three, finally, begin working toward a reconciliation. Ask, and it shall be given, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks, receive, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Matthew 7, 7-8. If you're seeking a resolution, you're going to find it. If we're the one bringing a criticism, we need to do this. Check our circumstances. Take it to the right source and do it in private. Matthew 18, 15. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Proverbs, Proverbs 11 and 13. Evaluate our motives. We need to ask. Am I doing this so I can prove the other wrong or to improve the relationship and leave the person better than before? We need to watch our method. Keep our spirit right as we seek to bring resolution. It says, you which are spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. Galatians 6.1. If you're on the receiving end of the confrontation or, or criticism, recognize that maybe it's just their own problem. Maybe they're trying to feel better about themselves. Maybe they, maybe they don't have all the facts. Maybe there is a real fault or issue that needs correcting. Sometimes God uses, uses others in a confrontation to reveal things about ourselves that we need to change. When someone comes to you and points out a fault, don't counterattack. All right, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. 1 Peter 2.24. If we don't counterattack, how should we respond? View the, confrontation, view the confrontation as sent by God. When, when, when someone comes to us, the first thing we should ask is, Lord, what do you want me to see in this? It will help us handle it better if we see the person we're in conflict with as sent by God to teach us rather than someone who's just afflicting us. We can see the conflict in one or two ways. See only the seeming attack or, or accusation which causes us to want to react in anger or revenge. Or see God's hand in allowing the conflict to help us change and become what he wants. Find the truth in the criticism. If there's no truth, then this is where understanding and peace comes. 
most of the time there is some truth in what is being said and God uses conflict to reveal our blind spots so he can make necessary changes. We need to prayfully search our hearts and ask God to reveal our failures. The Bible says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's Psalm 139, 22, 23. If we really want to please God, we'll ex accept the exposure of our faults during confrontation so we can correct them and be right with God and our brother. So in closing, if you, if you have done all you can and there is still no resolution, know that God won't hold you responsible for their actions and the ultimate outcome. All he expects is that we obey his will. If you do that, no matter how it turns out, you can walk away with a clear conscience before God. As you walk away, continue to control your tongue, Ephesians 4.29. Seek godly counsel if, if necessary. That's Proverbs 4, 11, 14. Take responsibility, respond or, or responsibility for yourself. Keep doing what is right. Recognize your limits. Use the ultimate weapon, deliberate, focused love. At the very least, it will protect you from being consumed by your own bitterness and resentment. Even if they persist in doing wrong, you can continue to trust that God is in control and will deal with them in his time, Proverbs or Psalms 10 and 37. This kind of patience is commended by God. The Bible says, for God is pleased with you when you do what, when you do what you know is right and patiently endure unfair treatment. Of course you, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. First Peter 2, 19 and 20. So I hope this growth track really um, helped, helped you to resolve any conflict in your life. And I'm praying that, that the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ himself, will arise in us and we will look like him, be like him, and reconcile all relationships that God has given us. God bless.